Thing. My apologies for being late. Thank you. Great. I'd like to call the order the joint meeting of uh, special meeting of the City Council and Planning Committee. Can we have a roll call, please? Oh, we're doing the Pledge of Allegiance first. So if we could do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now we'll call the roll. Councilmember Rouse is out of town. Councilmember Murillo is not feeling well, and Councilmember Hart has a scheduling conflict. So, um, good thing there's four of us here. That's good. Uh, before I move it over to public comment, just an acknowledgement to thank the planning commissioners for all the work that you do each and every week. Uh, it's a lot of details and makes our lives easier. So, I just want to acknowledge that. And I don't know if Mr. Campanella, you wanted to say anything as we get started. Well, we uh, we on the Planning Commissioner uh, Commission uh, really appreciate the semi-annual meetings when we get together. And uh, today's topic of uh, staff efforts is important because we all use their resources over the course of the year. So it'll be good to hear their presentation and have a discussion. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I have one public comment speaker slip. We'll get we'll do at this time, which is uh, Bill Lavoy. Come on up. And there's the podium right over there. And I will let you know when. Two minutes are up. <laughs> that, that's nice that that's what we want. Mayor, Councilman, <laughs> Commissioners, uh, Bill LaVoy, I'm here this morning representing the Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, our president is also out sick, so he was planning on being here. Um, he's not. Um, I'm, I'm here just to encourage you and to reiterate a request that was already sent from the commission um, to respectfully ask that the council support the Historic Preservation Work Program and follow up on the city commitment to direct that work be completed in a, in a timely manner. Um, work on the uh, pending draft ordinances and historic resource element implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, we'll turn it over to staff to get the work session going. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Council Members and Planning Commissioners. We also really appreciate your time in these semi-annual joint work sessions. And I'll just say, in case my voice cracks in and out, I'm getting over a cold and my voice is recuperating every day slightly. So if you had, if this meeting was Monday, Deborah might have been doing the whole presentation. So um, we do have a presentation to provide to you. Some of it um, is touching on elements that were in the council agenda report. Other areas we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into, give you a sense of, um, what's going on in the planning division, our major work efforts, as well as what we do just day-to-day -day standard operating procedures. So we'll touch on an overview of the major work efforts, and then we'll have some focused presentations where we'll dive a little bit deeper into um, housing development activity, the historic resources work program, and then our new zoning ordinance effort. So just a reminder of um, some major efforts that the planning division has recently completed or been very involved in helping to complete was the noise ordinance amendments that uh, your council recently adopted, as well as the minor zoning exceptions ordinance that went through earlier this year for adoption. We did also have the housing element adopted in uh, 2015. We're working on implementing that. The AUD ordinance, average unit size density incentive program was originally adopted in 2013 with the amendment in 2014. We also adopted the emergency shelter ordinance. We adopted a safety element of the general plan in 2013 and the historic resources element in 2012 and then the climate action plan in 2011. So quite a list there of things that we've recently completed. Um, this chart was attached to your CAR and I will walk through these elements and just um, briefly touching on each one. What this shows is our major work efforts, whether they're in progress or ongoing, and then um, shows the a span of five fiscal years so that we can note 
when work elements started and when we hopefully anticipate them to be complete. So the adaptive management program is part of the general plan implementation and that's ongoing and should be ongoing until 2030 through the life of the general plan. Average unit size density program monitoring is a part of that adaptive management program and that as well. We don't know the end date for that. We'll be monitoring that for as long as that program exists. Local coastal program update uh, began last fiscal year and we anticipate um, the, land, the land use plan, the land use policies to hopefully be um, that component completed by um, FY17, but then there's the implementation package of that too. So you see that going into fiscal year 18. New zoning ordinance, we um, hope to have that completed by FY17. Vacation rental enforcement began late uh, last calendar year. We're really starting to ramp up now. And again, that shows us being ongoing for the near term future um, until we get a sense of what sort of um, maintenance level we'll need for ongoing enforcement for that. CIR process improvements came out of the ZIR working group and we are very close to wrapping up the last couple items from that working group effort and so we do expect that to be done by the end of this fiscal year. The historic resource design guidelines have gone through HLC review and stakeholder input. They are awaiting action by council, but they're on hold at this moment because we need to get the historic districts ordinance amendments in place first. Tidemark Advantage Replacement Project is a multi-departmental effort to um, replace our permit tracking system. And so that's a multi-year effort too and, and a really a big project. So we don't expect that to be fully complete until FY18. And planning division staff are critical to that effort. So it is a major work effort. The multi-unit mixed-use design guidelines are um, an implementation action of the housing element that we've also had to put on hold for the time being, but we are hopeful we can get to that. Um, if not this fiscal year, then next. Um, the historic districts ordinance, as I mentioned, I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation as well. The community-wide greenhouse gas emissions inventory is um, really a mandate of the climate action plan. We need to do that every five years to keep our climate action plan whole and so that we can show that we're meeting the targets set out in the plan. And so we really need to try to do that this year. We do have a draft scope of work and we are working with um, Nina Johnson and Kate Wan in the administrator's office to um, also try to utilize some planning division staff that won't be freed up until another month or two, but we do believe that we can finish that within the course of four to six months. Um, so it might bleed into FY17 a little bit. Density bonus ordinance amendments. This first round is very straightforward. Right now our current ordinance is not in compliance with state law since it's been amended. So it's just a pretty minor amendment that we're putting forward to achieve that. It's not um, a wholesale amendment to the ordinance and that is already tentatively scheduled for planning commission consideration, I believe in April, May. North ordinance amendments, as I mentioned, were recently adopted. And then the environmental resources element is an, um, an update to the general plan element that's had to be put off um, given our staff resources dedicated to the local coastal program update. So we don't anticipate really starting a scope of work for that until next fiscal year. And the Highway 101 air quality setback, you'll recall, um, we have an ordinance in place right now that uh, requires certain projects within 250 feet of Highway 101 to have to consider special design um, elements in order to address particulate matter um, for air quality near the highway. Um, at some point, we, we believe we might be able to um, remove that 250 foot buffer if, if um, as the Air Resources Board believes that particulate matter is improving, um, we could wait for them to do that and, and, and no longer need this ordinance, or if we wanted to get out ahead of it and put resources towards doing our own local or localized study, um, we have it there as a potential item for next fiscal year. And then also in addition to that, we assist with other work efforts going on um, in other departments. The wireless facilities ordinance, we've been working with the city attorney's office on that. 
and we believe um, that should be making its way to the Planning Commission in the next couple of months. <coughs> Sign ordinance amendments. Again, the city attorney is in the lead on that effort. Um, um, they have begun to form the committee necessary to make those ordinance amendments. And I believe we're just awaiting city council confirmation of the committee. And um, Mr. Cologne um, said that that might be happening in the end of May. So we'll be seeing that move forward after that. Storefront Collective Dispensary Review. It's again a, a multi-departmental team of staff that will do annual reviews of the storefront collective dispensaries as well as financial audits of those businesses once they're actually open. We don't have any operational yet. The mobile food vending ordinance. This is, I'm referring to the mobile food vending operations taking place in the public right of way. City Attorney's Office, again, is the lead on that, and we are consulting with them on that. We are addressing mobile food vending on private property as part of the new zoning ordinance effort. So kind of trying to go forward together on those at the same time, consulting with each other. We're also, in response to legislation, expediting um, small residential solar photovoltaic permits, and then um, also assisting the transportation planning staff with a traffic model update and Mr. Dayton is here, should you have questions on that? Um, I understand that is progressing. And other things going on in the division. Um, this again is more of our ongoing work efforts. Services and operations, we are certainly seeing an increase in development activity. And in some cases, the um, the actual numbers may not reflect the activity level just because one project application doesn't necessarily encompass the complexity and the size of the projects we're seeing come in recently, but we are definitely seeing an increase. Development review activity is up 20% over last fiscal year. We're especially seeing an increase in the pre-application reviews, which is really good because that's an application or a pre-application that an applicant can make to get an early read on major issues or supportability of a project without having to invest a lot of money up front. And so we're seeing applicants utilize that. I think we're also seeing an, an uptick in those because they are required for some of the larger AUD projects too. So we're seeing significant increase in, in PRT applications. Um, we're also unfortunately seeing an increasing number of appeals so that is keeping us busy, and you're well aware of those on your agendas. And we are increasing training for staff on emerging issues like sea level rise, wireless facilities, medical marijuana regulations. And so we're trying to stay up to speed on those. And then we are also provide a lot of ongoing support to other departments. And one example listed there is every five years, the, um, the Jurisdictions within the county update the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. We've been involved in that. We also provide a lot of GIS support to other departments um, and to the water conservation, water resources staff and the drought regulations, giving them water demand statistics that we track. So we are a resource to a lot of other departments. So then just highlighting those few um, future work efforts that were on the chart that we said we would take on in the next couple of fiscal years is the GHG emissions inventory, historic districts ordinance, the multi-unit design guidelines, environmental resources element, and the Highway 101 air quality setback. So I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Andaloro, principal planner at this point, and she's going to go through some of the long-range planning efforts as well as the housing development activity. Good morning, council members and planning commissioners. Um, I'm going to just highlight really the housing development activity and housing element implementation report that was an attachment to your CAR. Um, as you know, housing is a perennial issue for our community and it was one of two of the top issues um, identified with our general plan update a few years back. And so we spend a considerable amount of staff time monitoring, tracking, analyzing and reporting on housing as well as other um, non-residential square footage. And um, especially now that we have the AUD program and we that is for a limited 
duration and a 250 unit test um, for certain types of units, we're really spending a lot of time um, tracking those. So once a month we are producing uh, an activity report and with that information we're updating a website. We have a map that you know people can go and see where the AUD projects are located, click on it and get basic project statistics. And I would encourage you to take a look at it. We're getting really positive feedback from the community that that's helpful um, for them. And we are also now committed to um, providing the Planning Commission with quarterly um, updates on housing activity, especially the AUD cases, and then doing the semi-annual um, housing development activity reports to um, both the Planning Commission and the City Council. So I just wanna highlight some of the information that's in that report. Um, the first is an update of the um, overall housing that has been constructed in about the last five and a half years. It represents 455 new residential units. And um, the good thing is that 88% of these units are being located um, in commercial and multifamily areas, which is what we wanted with our general plan. Um, these areas are closer to jobs, services, and transit. So we're being successful in that regard. Um, a lot of the, sorry, um, looking forward then, housing that is in the pipeline, and this is all types of housing. Um, we have quite a few units that are at some stage within our pipeline um, from just being pending to approved and then those with the building permit issued. Um, Mr. Dominguez has a question, go ahead. Yep. The um, chart, August 2010 to March 2016, what is, the, um, what is the data that you're using? Is this certificates of occupancy? Correct. And I was just concerned because I know when you introduced this topic, you talked about a 250 unit test but I believe we're into the 400s or higher. Right, this, this chart, chart two, um, sorry, I'll go back here. Chart one, this is all housing that has been built and occupied. So this isn't just the AUD units, it represents single family homes, um, for sale units that were possibly approved many years ago. Mm -hmm. But these are the ones that have been issued a certificate of occupancy during the last five and a half years. I, Do we track year to year how many certificates are issued? Yes. Because I think that would be helpful to see if there's year to year what the growth is. I know when the ordinance was first passed or when it was first being conceived in 2011, we were in the height of a recession and, and building was thought to, be, thought to be needed to be incentivized. And I know economic conditions have changed dramatically since then. So I'm kind of curious if we're watching that curve and if we have kind of a built-in provision to adjust these ordinances as the economic conditions change. We do have a built-in provision for that. That is our adaptive management program. And in the fall, um, we'll return with a fuller report about a lot of the general plan implementation, including um, various ordinances that are associated with the general plan policies. And at that time, I think we would be making any recommendations whether or not there needs to be adjustments. But um, at this point, well, as we go through the, the presentation, you'll see more information about the, the AUD program, which I think is what you're asking more specifically about. But I, I can't answer your question. I did look back between the period 2001 and 2007. So that's really pre-economic decline. And um, there were about 100 units that got certificates of occupancy during that period of time. So it, it's, we're roughly seeing the same thing over the last five and a half year period, per year. Per year, sorry, per year. And, and that just concerns me because uh, we, have, we talk about economic bubbles and if we have, it looks like we have 1,308 units in the housing pipeline now, and I wonder what that does to our staff numbers. I think Renee mentioned a 20% percent 
growth and development, and I'm not sure if that was year to, I think you mentioned it was a year to year. So I'm not sure if our ability to staff up, and also in the construction industry, I'm not sure what the macroeconomic effect is. Are we bringing in more workers who are specialized for new construction, and then three years later, if we if the bubble bursts, are they going to be then um, here unemployed, and we have created a, a larger social problem? Madam Mayor. Um, the on the the big number the next the next chart you don't uh, specify the single family dwelling piece there and I expect it's not a very big number but just can you have you have a guess on how many uh... it actually it is in the report okay. I just didn't go down to that specificity here when but I, just your what's your guesstimate I mean, it's low your recollection. <laughs> I mean, one, ten, fifty. About fifty, wasn't it? Fifty. Fifty, okay. fifty-one. You know. Thank you. And also on the AUD, we're about a hundred over what we expected. Correct? Uh, of the I think there's a. She's getting yeah. there. Yeah. So okay. That, I see well, I'll just jump ahead, ahead so, yeah. to the AUD. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so AUD applications. And um, we are spending a lot of time monitoring what's going on in this world. And just so you know, we produced this report um, based on statistics through the end of February. So March 1st, we cranked this out. And since that time, we have had three additional applications come in, which total just over 100 more units. So um, it's constantly changing, and hence the reason why we are doing so much monitoring and tracking. Um, right now, these are all the AUD applications that have been submitted, and they are at some point in the process. You can see that certificates of occupancy have only been issued for two units. Um, we have a lot of units that are... Um, pending 440 units and again now another 100 added to that we have 175 units that have received approval but we know that it takes somewhere between uh, three months to three years to get uh, construction drawings um, financing everything up and going, and then there is the construction period itself. So there's a, quite a bit of lag time there. So, and then maybe the Planning Commission has talked about this in more detail, but what, what, would, what would be the staff pro recommendation process of, after you know, this 250-unit number, which you can't really monitor or assess until their people are in them, uh, and then meanwhile there's this mm -hmm. big number in the pipeline, uh, and if there were changes that wanted to be made after this uh, analysis, how does that work to those that are already in the pipeline? I mean, I'm sure you've thought about this. Um, so what, what, what's the thinking to date so far? Um, Madam Mayor, the ordinance is written that if the projects are in the pipeline, they are, they can proceed, even if we sunset out, we've issued 250, certificates of occupancy, whatever is in the pipeline, which would be the application has been submitted and it has been agendicized. So, so, so then we want to make sure that the moment there is 250 certifi certificates of occupancy, we are ready to go with the analysis. We don't want to wait until figuring out what that analysis looks like or how it's going to be done. Uh, we, you know, when that happens, we want to have it basically done soon after because if there's any changes to be made we're going to have an issue with projects in the pipeline. Correct. And that that speaks to a lot of the reason why we're here presenting the information today, why we are meeting quarterly with the planning commission and producing all this information. Um, in our discussions with the planning commission they are asking us to add additional statistical information all the time. And so now we're adding in to what we're reporting on the average unit size in these developments, the number of stories, the heights, whether or not they've been appealed, whether or not they have been called up, you know, from the design review body up to the planning commission. 
um, and we're keeping a close tab. What's interesting is we have a lot of projects in the pipeline. We don't know how many of them will actually be constructed. We have a few that are under construction today. Um, we don't anticipate really, if, if we're going to be monitoring them, it's gonna happen over the next 18 to 24 months. Um, I, I, I can't come up with a recommendation today about how to do this. We know when we come back in the fall, we will have more information. Some of the projects will be up and running. Um, we're going to have to see what they look like on the ground and assess them. We know the Planning Commission has worked with staff to come up with a survey that is now a condition of approval for the projects, but there's gonna be a lag time before we actually get that survey data. So staff is now starting to look at other ways that we'll be able to assess these. We may have to go out and do some sleuthing and figure out what are the rents? Where did the people come from? Where are they working in these units? And how we do that, we're not exactly sure right now. Um, okay, well, as long as we're starting the discussion, because now, starting that's, that's the, the discussion. point. Yeah. Yeah. This, I didn't expect it's an answer. It's ongoing all the time. Right, but at yeah. least there's a process. Um, Mr. Hotchkiss and then Mr. White. Um, I think I saw in the report that you have a questionnaire that the uh, landlords will use, correct? Or owners? Yeah, um, Council Member Hodgkiss, that um, survey was um, drafted by a subcommittee of the Planning Commission. Right. It's now being a condition of approval for many of the AUD projects. Um, the so we have this condition. It will be submitted after the units are constructed and occupied. But there's this lag time that will happen. We don't have any units that are in the test program that are actually have certificate of occupancies and that are occupied. And then the residents are going to have to be there for a certain period of time before the survey becomes uh, due and submitted to us. And in the meantime, we're seeing a lot of projects that are in the pipeline that could be constructed. I noticed one of the things you're asking or will ask, and I think it'll probably take a year before you get this information back, is how many cars people own. The real variation of that is also where are they now? Is that worth asking? I mean, because we really want to know, are the cars on the street? Are they San Luis Obispo, whatever? Correct? My, is that not something we want to ascertain? We could certainly modify the survey to be more specific in that I, question. I don't know if that's asking too much, but it would certainly be helpful to know that. Yeah. Maybe the other members have a thought on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and certainly, I, I know that the um, car ownership issue is one, for example, if you go back to Casas de las Fuentes, it's it's since it's part of the um, um, housing authority, they are able to monitor it much more closely rather than a free market uh, landlord situation. But that that was just uh, Mr. Hotchkiss's question was was core to to that experiment at that time. So I appreciate the question. It's it obviously is much harder to do with with the free market rental. The, um, my recollection of the AUD is that. Um, the, the the cutoff point um, for new projects when the two, 250 is reached is projects that have a determination of application completeness. Mm -hmm. And you were using the term pipeline, and then there's a significant difference there. Uh, and, I mean, uh, as one who has performed this process from in the private sector, there's a, and, and Mr. Campanella can speak to that too, there's a great big difference between being in the pipeline and having, a, and, and, and Ms. Peugeot as well, and, and, a, and, and having a, a complete application. It's, it's, a, it's a huge difference. So I, that may be something for us to hear, you know, as if you needed to have one more suggestion for something to measure. But that's one that I know is 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 very traceable for you folks, yeah. uh, and you I, you probably have that number in the top of your head. But that would be something maybe for us to, uh, and uh, we're getting into the discussion. Uh, we're jumping obviously all the way in, and I appreciate that it's it's uh, uh, we're probably we are getting ahead of ourselves, but we're at least in the meat of the matter, and that's that's the most important thing. Council Member White, I think 
that is it's key in the pipeline where they're at but as you'll recall many of these projects only go to the design review body and so the completeness determination can be much simpler than projects that maybe go on to the Planning Commission and are larger and more complicated and so when we're talking about when an application is deemed complete for a project that's only going to a design review body that can be just when it gets agenda sized so those can be they're submitted and they, it's a pretty rapid turnaround and that was part of the program was to have them quickly reviewed and up and running so and the date there was um was it eight years mm -hmm. eight. Correct. so we're in year or hmm? 200 or, i know whichever yeah. suit but you know i guess we're right i think the number we're going to reach before eight years yeah, I think so too. <laughs> right. okay. and just to not forget that that's what's currently codified that it would be this program would be in place for eight years or until 250 units are occupied you do of course have the ability to amend the ordinance before that should council want to so they like like that's so simple <laughs> <laughs> the super majority vote of the council you know it's like oh just any Tuesday no problem um, go ahead mr. Dominguez so I have a, a couple of questions or recommendations for staff one I, I would recommend we stop using the term test test is like to use an analogy when you go into Rory's ice cream and you ask for a little spoon of ice cream we've gone into Rory's and bought 25 gallons untested because according to your, your numbers, we've built, or we have in the pipeline, 1,300 units. We've got 753 units. And that more than, or almost doubles what we had from 2010 to 2016. That's, that's not a test, frankly. That's, that's not a test. Yeah. We've, we've completely changed the macroeconomic structure of development in Santa Barbara. That's no longer a test. We've, we've taken all of our eggs and put it into one basket for the next it looks like it's going to go on for three years and you mentioned that we don't know how many of these will actually be developed and that's a great point but i had asked a few months ago one of my first meetings and again i wasn't present for a lot of the deliberation i asked staff what percentage of of permits that get pulled actually carry through and get constructed and i think that's a useful forecasting tool it's not ever going to be 100 percent accurate but mm -hmm. to keep calling this a test is completely stretching that word beyond any conceivable use anymore so the other recommendation is to is to look at this in terms of the original goals and i think that's what the subcommittee is doing on uh, the planning commission and in terms of talking about a conversation getting started and having a fall discussion i think we really need to push it up to the summer I, i'd like to hear some proposals and um I know generally this is the body that's supposed to push policy and make policy decisions, but we really need to hear from staff the impact is having both on staff, on development in the city, and then we can come back with, with proposals to amend this because without some really um, strong narrative support from staff, because you guys are dealing with this day to day and we see it every, every week or every you know, semi-annual report like this, it's really hard for us to get in there. And, and the uh, legislation was passed with with a lot of discussion but again it's it's now getting to the point where we need to tweak it it's a couple years old and it has we uh i think wanted to put our foot on the gas pedal a little bit but we've floored it and we added all the logs into the fire and the problem is three years from now there's no more logs because when you guys did your housing element uh report i think it was about a year ago or a little over a year ago you identified all the lots in the in the city that were capable of being developed this is going to take all of that primary uh, capacity off the market. So if this isn't meeting our, our goals for affordable housing, when this program's over, there's going to be nothing left to develop for affordable housing. And that's, that's one of my main concerns. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Why don't you oh. keep going? And we can, we can, have, we can flush yeah. out the full discussion um, as, as, as I, you're getting through the I did want to just respond to Council Member Dominguez because I... I know you're relatively new here <laughs> so I think you're mixing the overall number of housing units that are somewhere in the pipeline those that are not AUD specific they're all different types of housing because the AUD program the incentive program is a particular type of housing 
that occurs, but we have other housing activity within the city. So for the AUD program, we have 479 units. Not to say that that's, you know, not a, a nice size number, but it's not the overall picture of what's in the pipeline in the city. So I just want to clarify that. Um, so I have jumped all over in what my so my can, original. Can, can I follow up? And what is the 753? <laughs> okay, I'll I'll clarify that if you don't mind. Yeah. So on chart six showing the 753 units, that's all AUD projects. So those are projects that are taking advantage of the incentives in the AUD program, the one parking space per unit requirement, the reduced setbacks, the, re the more flexible open space. That's 753 units that are utilizing those aspects of the program. The 479 are those that are either in the priority overlay or the high density areas where they get the increased density as well as those development standard incentives. So that's the distinction between those numbers. And this 479 are the only units that would count against that 250 trial <laughs> initial period of the program. <laughs> So still, yeah. still, um, still above 250, yeah. correct. In the pipeline, even those units that would count towards that, we are at 479 at some stage of review. So that's you know, not insignificant, but just to clarify the distinction between the 753, the difference between those two would be units that are proposed in the medium high, the R3, R4 areas that are not utilizing the higher density tiers of the program. So it's more akin to what was previously allowed under variable density in terms of actual number of units on the site. Okay. One quick one. Uh, in that 753 are 205 affordable, uh, big A affordable units that are using AUD parameters. So that's part of the 753 as well, 205 units in there. Affordable. Just want to point that out. So, in summary, our, yeah, <laughs> our AUD incentive program activity is up. Um, we did have a request to look at the number of design review referrals up to PC, and there's only been really two. Uh, one of them was at the applicant's request. These would be projects that would normally only go to a design review body. Um, but because of their location being highly visible, they may, the design review body may want to get input from the Planning Commission. So one of those projects, the applicant requested to go to the Planning Commission for, com for comments. And the second one, the design review body asked that the applicant go to the Planning Commission and they chose to redesign the project, which is a good outcome. They're listening. Um, we've had minimal appeals really on the AUD program and none in the high priority or high density um, areas. Um, we have had a recent appeal on a project that um, would be an affordable project, but it wasn't on the AUD program. It's based on a creek setback. So um, really, we're not seeing a lot of um, issues. The system seems to be working for reviewing those projects. Um, Within the housing activity report, we also provided information about the housing element implementation, the five um, programs that were the priority programs of all the implementation actions that are in the housing element. These, about a year ago, we were here and they were outlined for us to work on. And so, um, real quickly, those. <coughs> those priority actions including looking at zoning standards to facilitate housing and we've been able through the new zoning ordinance process to address those issues um, looking at outdoor living space, um, how setbacks are um, required and then the reduction of the minimum unit size. So that's being taken care of through the new zoning ordinance process. As far as preserving rental units, of course, that was reviewing whether or not we wanted to um, do ordinance amendments to allow short-term rentals, including vacation rentals. 
and we worked with the Planning Commission and, and the Council um, in 2015, and in the end, we did not pursue that, and now we are um, in an ongoing enforcement of those short-term rentals, um, and we see that continuing on for a number of years. The density bonus ordinance, um, Renee's already reported on that. It's underway. We should be seeing that shortly at the Planning Commission. I've just reported on the AUD incentive program monitoring and then the multifamily design guidelines, as Renee said, they are pending additional resources at this point. Um, the final component of the housing activity report was the um, requirement of the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, they want to report annually on how we are implementing, and so it is, you know, a, a form that we're required to submit to the state to keep us in compliance with um, their housing element laws, and the significance of that is that it keeps us eligible for certain grants moving forward. Otherwise, it's information that you get in the housing activity report. So that concludes get an, my... Get another question, oh, and then yep. Ms. Schwartz after that. Yes, I had a question when you mentioned the vacation rental enforcement. Going back to the AUD, <laughs> um, it came up in discussions I had with several planning commission members and community members that some of the um, AUD units would be uh, capable of vacation rental housing under the law. And so that's something that I would add into the conversation. And again, hopefully as soon as possible, not in the fall, because again, I'm, a, I'm a afraid of mission creep. And if the original mission was for more affordable housing, um, having several or hundreds of these units turn into vacation rentals, again, really defeats the purpose of, of the ordinance. Are you saying ones that are in the R4 that go through the process? I don't see how else under our current enforcement process that these AUD units would become vacation rentals. If they're in the commercial zone or the R4 zone? Kind of, kind of, not really. I, I think you're, I think you're, there's a little exaggeration there, so. Um, okay. Do you want to? Um, add to that, thank you. Um, so those AUD projects that are utilizing the high density or overlay the high pri or priority or overlay densities that are again going into that higher density tier, there's a condition of approval that those remain residential rental for the life of the project. So that in a, you know, above and beyond our code requirement that says you can't operate a vacation rental without legally going through the conversion process, they also have a recorded condition on their title that says this needs to remain residential. So we have an added layer of protection there for those that aren't subject to that particular condition because they aren't taking advantage of the additional higher density tiers, they would need to seek the same conversion permits that any other existing housing unit would need to seek. And again, as we have explained, it's it's an onerous process, um, especially to wholesale convert more than one unit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. Um, uh, Ms. Schwartz and then Mr. White. Uh, well, I had a question about our short-term vacation rental program, so to speak, or process in the R4 and commercial. Um, when I see throughout our documents today reference to staff resource pressures, I'm wondering if moving forward with some level of allowances for short-term vacation rentals in those zones, if um, staff is talking with the city attorney's office or, or, or other um, to develop a program for full cost recovery. And this has been on my mind since we decided to disallow short-term vacation rentals in R1 and 2, well, R1, 2, and 3. Uh, but with increased monitoring and enforcement that will be required uh, and with staff constraints, I'm wondering if there have been discussions around making sure that whether it's fees, taxes, and so forth, that we're going to build that into what could be an increase in requests and applications and allowances for that. Um, Madam Mayor and Councilor, um, Commissioner Schwartz, if I understand your comment or question is more towards 
full cost recovery for processing applications to convert, not for enforcement, or was it? I'm not real. I'm not referencing both? AUD. I'm just talking about those who are. I don't know if we have one application in now or two um, for a short term vacation rental in R4 and or commercial zones. I see. Okay. Uh, but and th this is the reason this is top of mind for me after going through both the planning commission hearing, council hearing, the significant effort by the city attorney's office, and I know this isn't centrally in the Planning Commission purview, but since we're talking about staff resource and pressures today, um, and with the significant compliance resources being used just on what's, go what's going on with the prohibition today, I'm wondering what we're gonna be doing differently. Here's my bottom, bottom line. What are we gonna be doing differently with applications, monitoring and compliance, allowing short-term vacation rentals in R4 and commercial that will allow us to fully recover um, the cost of our staff resources on that program. And this is a theme I'm going to be asking about because I, I don't know um, how we can continue, quite frankly, to apply staff resources in areas that don't further recover our costs. So, again, I know this isn't central to planning commission role, but since we're jointly talking about this and this theme is throughout the documents we have today, I think it's probably germane at least to tee it up and then you can take it up with you know, the appropriate departments, council, and a council member White and I have chat, chat, chatted about it briefly, also Dominguez, and so any, any information you can shed on it, uh, any light today would be helpful, but then if you could just note that and. Certainly, I, it, we'll note that, and also as part of our um, budget presentation and adoption process to council is our fee resolution, so that could be a, a, a time to consider that. Did you have something, or not, no, you're, you're good? You got answer. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Try to. Uh oh. So switching gears slightly to design review and historic preservation, I wanted to spend some time um, going through the critical elements of the five-year historic preservation work program. Um, it was brought up by a public speaker today. Um, Historic Landmarks Commission um, is certainly encouraging prog progress on this work program. So you'll recall the historic resources element of the general plan was adopted in 2012. In that are 47 implementation actions. So in order to focus staff's work in the first five years of the implementation of the element, we developed the Historic Preservation Work Program which really focused on seven actions um, to help carry out the historic resources element. And we are, our charge is to work on those seven action items in the next five years, or we're you know, about halfway through those, uh, that period at this point. So um, I'll, I'll run through quickly those seven elements. The first is the historic district's implementation. And this is, um, does require an, an amendment to the municipal code to establish a process to um, recommend and actually form historic districts. So we do need that codified and that's something that had, we had started to make progress on that in early 2013 and had a meeting with the ordinance committee and then that's been stalled since then. But we do anticipate being able to put resources towards that in the next few months and working with the city attorney's office to make more progress on that at, um, through this calendar year. The historic resource design guidelines really got out ahead of the historic district's ordinance amendments. As I mentioned, we have a draft complete. HLC has approved that and recommended that city council approve it. But it's been sitting in a draft form at this point because we really need the historic district's ordinance established in the municipal code in order for that companion docu document of the design guidelines to carry its full weight. So um, we're ready to move on that, but it, it needs to be on hold for just a bit longer. The ordinance provisions for historic structures, uh, I, sh I say here that the new zoning ordinance will partially implement that, and it's really just a small part of that. Uh, really, those action items of the historic resources element were calling for flexibility and in code interpretations, and it was beyond zoning code, it was fire and building code to be able to um, promote preservation of historic resources to, through flexibility of interpretation of those codes. 
and also to add a specific finding for zoning modifications to address the preservation of historic structures. So the new zoning ordinance will partially get at this because we are proposing some more leniency for non-conforming structures, the structures that don't meet the zoning standards and what they can do to alter or add to their building, which could help the preservation of some historic structures. Uh, the fourth element was to flag parcels in our uh, GIS database that are near historic resources. We just finished that internal part. Um, we have yet to complete the actual tagging of these parcels so that the public are also aware that if they're working on a project near historic resource that they are made aware of that. And the historic resources element calls for special consideration for design review boards review of projects that are near historic resources. So this mapping effort will help staff be able to identify to the design review board that they're reviewing a project near uh, an important resource. Madam Mayor, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is this utilizing this outside company that I've become familiar with um, that has new technology for mapping? Um, oh. and I've, I'm not recalling the name. Um, Is that the But this came up in the course of our review of 800 Santa Barbara thing, Street. Yeah. LIDAR, is that it? Did, can, no, it's not. They are. It's not. Maybe this. can you just, you know, in a sentence or tell us what's going on with this new mapping of the city by this or sure. the use of their technology? Mr. Lamone will be with, able to give more oh, detail on that. Yeah. Great. Um, Councilman Pilot, Planning Commission members, we have had several presentations uh, made um, from this private uh, com uh, contractor. Um, his uh, firm is OGO. And they use uh, flyover um, radar uh, technology to pinpoint elevations. And they actually can map the entire city, half flown the entire city. And they've made some presentations on what they're capable of producing. They've done some experimentation on um, very detailed um, uh, 3D modeling. And we're excited because we're looking at uh, possibly the future of having 3D submittals as uh, another tool for the, our decision review makers. And they've actually had some tests on some uh, projects. Uh, they've also um, uh, uh, are interested in uh, making themselves available for private developers. But the city has its own separate LIDAR um, um, contract in place. So we're not really taking advantage of what they have, but they're looking to see if they can involve themselves and offer it to private developers. So that will be a tool what we see in the future. Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Renee, could you go back a slide? I, I, I'd like a clarification on something. So we have historic districts, and then, of course, we have various levels of historic structures that are potential or actually... Um, um, approved as a historic structure. So when you talk about the historic resource design guidelines um, and any perhaps further more specific ordinance changes or building code, fire code changes, do those apply within uh, to both those circumstances? Would it be everything in a historic district plus everything else that might be a designated structure of some level? Right. I, thank you, um, Commissioner Pujo and Jaime, if you want to add more, you can. But my understanding is the design guidelines speak generally to historic resources in general, whether or not they're in a district and how you would treat an, ad, an addition or alteration or, or um, upgrade to that structure. And then it does speak specifically to um, buildings within a historic district or adjacent to a historic district, which is why they really got out ahead of actual ordinance to establish historic districts. So it does speak to both. And then um, the work that you're doing to take a look at building code, fire code, and maybe additional ordinance amendments. I, I understand the ones in the, in the, um, in the ENZO draft. Um, those apply actually to things non-conforming, not just historic sure. designations or districts. But if you go further than that with some of those other items, would those apply to both situations do you anticipate or you don't even have that sorted out yet? We haven't really started that effort yet to look at how we might flexibly interpret fire and building codes. So that's a part of the historic preservation work program that we haven't put um, effort into yet. Thank you. When you say adjacent to a historic district, is that 50 feet or 100 feet? Or is there, how do we figure what adjacent means? 
I may. <laughs> that may be too detailed a question. There are, differ, there are differing sensitivity areas depending on the status of the historic resource, and so I think I may. Those, That's those a good numbers. question, Councilman Hotchkiss. So we we uh, uh, actually mapped several um, uh, sensitivity zones around resources. We settled on 50 feet right. for most designated structures, and we're going to use 100 feet for um, National Register eligible properties. So that seems to be a fair uh, amount of uh, fairness applied to the, the more important resources. If somebody is included unexpectedly to them in the historic uh, district, how does that affect them? It just brings there uh, any changes or improvements under uh, new guidelines, is that correct? Um, certainly, we, we do have, uh, and council has adopted historic districts, sing, uh, single uh, por portions of the city. Right. Uh, but it, what we'd like to do is make the process clear in our ordinance so the public can participate because these districts are gonna be much larger in, in size as opposed to the smaller ones that we've dealt with up to this point. And so the engaging the public in that process so they understand when council acts, what the limitations may be and the type of reviews that might be required as a result of those that district designation. Okay, so it's not prevention, but it's a, a guidance on how to elaborate or improve your... That's your correct. And uh, it's focused on preservation of streetscapes and I, I, making, maintaining the character of the neighborhood is the focus. A any idea what percent of our city will therefore be covered, do we expect? That's probably a pretty big question. Uh, well, there are approximately six uh, identified districts, and it's uh, uh, probably about 800 par uh, properties at this point, 800 out of 25,000 parcels. It's, right, right. Thank you very much. You're okay. Um, MEA updates the, that portion of the Historic Preservation Work Program calls for periodic updates to our master environmental assessment portion that um, what we commonly refer to our, is our potentials list. These are the structures that have the potential to be designated a structure of merit or um, landmark. And we did recently update that. So that is something we've recently completed and would, would continue to refine that list. The online historic database is an effort that we began in um, April, I believe it was, April of last year, so just about a year ago, working with a consultant to um, have online a searchable database for the public to use records of our historic structures so they can look at the history. Um, um, but we've hit some stumbling blocks with the consultant, so we're behind on that, but we are making more progress with that going forward and hopefully should be able to see that online in the next few months. And then the last is, is very much related to the first item. This historic and design districts ordinance, again, is an ordinance amendment. We were hoping to um, actually create a new chapter in the code that deals with just historic districts and then have the code section that we currently have uh, that um, discusses HLC and their purview um, as its own separate um, ordinance. So that really would go hand in hand with that first ordinance amendment I spoke to that would go through the criteria of how to form a district. And so that should move forward hopefully along the same timeline as our historic districts ordinance. And here again, as I've, as I've been mentioning, our last major effort on the historic districts ordinance was when we spoke with council ordinance committee in April 2013 and we talked about how the draft elements of what might be in that ordinance. We hope going forward that we would return to the ordinance committee again to just check in again on that draft outline to make sure we're still on the same page. And then with a the draft ordinance later in the summer, um, hopefully through HLC review and then council action uh, by the end of this year. And then this is wrapping up very soon. Uh, Multi-unit design guidelines is one of the remaining top five priorities of implementing our housing element. So it is an important work item. We wanna be able to get to this. We did have some initial subcommittee work of the Planning Commission, ABR and HLC, and they have proposed for us um, a variety of ways that we might be able to have adopted multi-unit design guidelines as well as different resource needs for those scopes of work. We haven't been able to put the staff resources on this to actually initiate this work effort. We are working on our development activity, 
also want to make sure that we get this work on the historic districts ordinance complete before we take on another major work effort. So we do not yet have, um, we don't have money allocated in the planning division budget to hire a consultant to help us with this. So if we were able to um, find internal staff resources to work on this, like I said, we need to be able to work through some initial um, existing work efforts first. And so this is still on hold until we either have uh, consultant funds or staff available. I think I may have asked and actually advocated for it our last semi-annual work, work session um, in support of Mr. Limon and, and that team um, and our subcommittee's work to move forward in, ad, in um, requesting from the council in the, in the next budget cycle, the current budget cycle, uh, for a consultant. And I'm wondering if staff uh, is uh, planning or intending to uh, fold that into the budget request to council, um, council hearings that will be underway. Uh, Madam Mayor, Commissioner Schwartz, it's not currently in our proposed planning division budget mm -hmm. to have a specific line item for consultant services for this. And is, can you tell me a little bit more why, why there's a hesitancy or why you don't think that the timing is right? And I ask because with all of the planning, the applicate... There's probably just no money. That's the simple answer, but go ahead. I mean, that's, and that's the, uh, I think, but I think, I didn't mean to interrupt well, I you. Always, I know it's a matter <laughs> of juggling the money, so I get it. You know, I watch the hearings myself, too. And I, the reason I'm asking is because with the continued increase in planning activity around all the applications that are coming in, um, which means that there's a higher level of activity for the Planning Commission and all the review boards, this issue of qualitative decision-making, I think that's Mr. Kalan's word, qualitative decision-making, that is used across these decision-making bodies. There is an ongoing issue that the community has of the city and the way we make decisions and just of our own efforts to um, create con clear and consistent decisions, findings of approval, et cetera, um, specifically in this area of multi-unit mixed-use design guidelines. And I, I just think it's, um, I think it's more important I'll just propose it's more important than I think we're elevating it to be. So I don't know what else the council might want to do in talking about it or with staff. And um, my my it's, suggestion it's would be the planning commission the and all the design review boards get a budget presentation on the community development department budget before it comes to the budget um, hearing for council. Is that correct, uh, Madam Mayor? We had revised that approach beginning last year. Um, if we're not making significant changes to the planning division budget, what I've been doing is summarizing our proposed budget in an email to all the board and commission members. Um, okay. Well, it may, I mean, certainly getting um, recommendations from the commissions is always helpful prior to the council's budget hearing when that part of the city's um, budget's being discussed. So whether that should be agendized for a planning commission hearing or individual members want to send, but I think you probably want to come, you know, some kind of conversation. Um, I know I, I take those very seriously from when the Parks and Rec Commission comes to us with their budget and it helps us juggle all the various um, items that I know is becoming, I think, a little harder this year considering the amount of revenue is not as robust as we thought it would be, and so certainly getting recommendations from the Planning Commission in particular, maybe not all the design review boards, but at least the Planning Commission would be helpful. I think that addresses what you're um, expressing. And I think that, you know, if, if I can say on, on a positive note, the AUD program is pressing this, is bringing this to the fore, and so with that program under scrutiny and underway and looking to the trial period, sunsetting in the not too distant future, all of the activity, it seems to me this is this should be closer to a top line item in terms of figuring out how to move this forward. I know there's a lot to juggle, but that would be my, my own personal recommendation. Thank you. Okay, two, three more slides, I promise. Switching now to zoning, um, I do just want to point out um, in your council agenda report, due to the timing of when we wrote that report, we anticipated having an additional staff member on board as of last week to uh, work in the zoning enforcement section. We've had a little bit of an issue with actually bringing that person on board, so that has not yet occurred, but we are working as fast as we can to get that position filled. So that um, is not quite true 
we were hopeful. Um, so just a quick update on the new zoning ordinance, walking through what we've already accomplished in terms of the use regulations. We've had a public workshop and a planning commission meeting on that. That's what we're calling module one. That was last summer development standards. We recently had the ENZO joint committee meetings on that in December and then the public workshop and planning commission meeting just a few weeks ago. Right now, staff is currently reviewing an administrative draft of the procedures and definitions and the parking standards of the new zoning ordinance. And we anticipate bringing that to an ENZO joint committee and planning commission meetings. I believe we're looking at June, June, July, Danny is saying. <laughs> um, Still, though, really working hard to get a complete draft of ENZO in late fall. And then just touch on development review. An attachment to your CAR was a list of significant development review projects. That list seems to keep growing, and it is just it is what it says. Those are just the significant ones. We do still have you know, some of the regular single-family additions and, and that in the coastal zone. And, of course, a lot of design review projects as well. Um, but wanted to highlight some of the significant ones for you because you'll probably be hearing about them or have questions from your constituents about them. And so with that, Great. that concludes our Thank you. presentation. I want to just make sure, is there any um, public comment at this time about anything related to today's workshop? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment. So then it basically just comes back to the group here. If any, uh, maybe just go around the uh, circle here and if there's any comments or questions at this point as we're it's a lot of work uh, so first off thank you for all the work there but um, and if you have anything at this point now's your chance Ms. Brugeau no nope. I'll pass this time thank you okay all right Mr. White thank you Madam Mayor um, I won't pass um, first of all I, I really appreciate that we have in place um, a capable team of staffers to handle this pig in the python. Um, what's we obviously and uh, Mr. Uh, Dominguez used the term uh, uh, flooring it, and I would say we kind of popped the clutch after the crash, and we def and we had the the um, the AUD in place or coming into place. And uh, we also have, I think it's good to hearken back to what, why are we doing some of this? That we have, is it 25,000 people a day uh, commuting into the region? Something like that. And we don't have places for our teachers, our nurses, uh, and that level of profession to live here. And the development that had been happening for the previous decade was kind of a cartoon where we had two 2,200 square foot studio condos uh, being proposed and that, that, that our current system was being stretched and tweaked out of shape from its original intent. So this is the next iteration. This is trying to address the, that, that set of concerns and do something that's going to have people give people uh, of the people we need to live here a place to live and and we don't and while the RDA while the RDA all the, the the money for affordable housing went away so we had, we had to resort to the marketplace and this is what's happened and obviously it's succeeding beyond uh, our, all expectations and we don't want it, it to get out ahead of us. And I think that's kind of, a, I would say, if Mr. Uh, Dominguez's kind of questions and, and statements in the midst, it's, it's a really important that we not lose the, the side of the character of our city and that we uh, make sure that we're not, for, for trying to obey rules and stuff, that we're not uh, uh, letting go of the, of the sort of the real uh, core vision of, of our city. So, um, I, and I appreciate the comments that Ms. Schwartz uh, made about staffing and that we need whatever is going on, we want to have in place um, uh, the right uh, uh, force to, to, uh, to manage this uh, bulge. And so I think that's going to be something really as, as we 
go into budget hearings, we really uh, look at hard so that we're, we're handling this surge uh, responsibly. And uh, it's, it's important, uh, it's critical, and there are issues such, and obviously water is right there, uh, water and traffic are gonna be right you know, there. We wanna make sure that we're uh, being sensible with those pieces as well. Um, the, I, I, and I agree with Ms. Schwartz, the, the, uh, the term, the guidelines for multi-use, what's that, what's, give me the exact. Multi-family, multi-use. Multi-unit, multi mixed-use. Yes, I think mm -hmm. all, that is, that is, it feels to me like a really important area to be, to be f focusing on. Uh, my comments, for example, on one of a recent project is the, the parking requirements for the three-bedroom AUDs is, is an example of just something I'm going, uh, that worries me. And so I, I expect that some of that will come out in, in, that, uh, in that work effort. So um, I expect we, we will need more staff as somehow, whether it's contract, on a contract basis. Uh, we have really qualified people uh, out there who are available if we're willing to invest in it. And I know I will be... Uh, uh, querying uh, our, our finance team and our management team to, to be making sure that we're, we're doing a good job of, of, of managing this bulge. It's, it's exciting. I think it's answering some real needs of this city. So that part of it is good. And we're not, gonna, not getting the proposals for those 2,000 square foot studio condos, which do nothing more than add more people coming into town to serve them, because those are going to be homes for very wealthy folks that are going to need service, and, and that, uh, uh, that would just push that, uh, that part of the equation even more out of balance. So it's exciting, and it's a big responsibility that this team of council and planning commission members, mm -hmm. ABR, et cetera, uh, steward this city and this effort uh, over this next uh, couple of years. And, yeah. Great, thanks. We were going around the circle. Did you want, did you have any questions or comments at this point? Gentlemen. Yep. Uh, I think my, my, well, a couple of things. Well, let me start kind of on a smaller level if I could. Back on historic resources, I'm wondering if staff has uh, done any research on um, looking for grants to help us uh, whether they're state agency grants, state or federal, but also private philanthropic grants. There's a lot of interest in the historic resource uh, preservation and protection in our community. And with so many um, private philanthropic foundations in our area, I'm wondering if we're pursuing that. Do, do, we, do we pursue those sorts of um, private grants in addition to state and federal grants? Um, Commissioner Schwartz, I'm, I'm being told by Mr. Lamone, at this point, we, we have not tried to seek out those okay. types of funds. Well, that would be a recommendation that I would have then if we've not already um, looked into that um, to move this forward, to get the, re the staff resources we need, the money we need, the staff resources we need uh, to move that ahead. And this is sort of the theme I have is what else do we need to do and where can we find the funds to do it perhaps outside of the city? And you know, we have such a successful history, especially, or track record, especially the transportation group on securing funds for a lot of our important projects. I don't know if planning has been engaged in that sort of grant, grant seeking. And I, you know, there's, I know that coast, I, I know because I'm on that subcommittee, the local coastal plan. You know, I, I'm familiar with those sorts of grants, but I didn't know it. But any rate, any rate, just to, to, to note, uh, I think that's an important, and I know that takes time to to uh, to research and apply for grants. I'm familiar with that, uh, so that's just my comment on historic resources overall on housing. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is I'm going into my seventh and a half year on planning commission, and when we see the roller coaster of um, the economy, investment in land development, both locally out of area land development, and now with the AUD. And with the um, termination of the RDA, as Mr. White was referencing, I think it's important to be more creative than ever. The city's relationship with the community, meeting with the housing authority, with, uh, with investors, uh, with current developers, 
to first of all further educate. We've talked about this, I think, with Mr. Buell and, and even others on staff. There are many in our community that are not as educated as I think they could be on what our policies are to encourage the type of housing development, the various types, I should say, plural, that we're looking for. And I believe, and Mr. Campanella and I met some months back with Mr. Buell and staff about this, I believe the city has an opportunity to take uh, an even greater leadership role in encouraging or even establishing conversations with these various stakeholder or constituencies to educate them about what our policies are, what the opportunities are through our policies that encourage this, and to try to facilitate collaboration and, and financing cooperation between the subsidized housing community and the non-subsidized vis-a-vis not just AUD, but where we have development and redevelopment opportunities. Um, I think the good news is I, I know there's a bit of a, um, a kind of a, a skeptical in some camps or maybe even a harshly critical eye that's cast on AUD. The good news is we have very outdated and dilapidated properties owned by longstanding Santa Barbarans uh, where there's new interest in redeveloping, it's adaptive reuse, it's redevelopment, and I think the AUD program is affording that, is encouraging that, so to me that's, that's good news. I think the sooner we can get our success criteria guidelines established, vetted finally through planning commission, sent to council, I'm hoping that that will be a tool that will first, and, and with community feedback and with public feedback, that will allow us and maybe give us more comfort in evaluating the, the projects that are coming through initially. And then once we get certificate of occupancy um, in these earliest units, as quickly as possible evaluate the success against approved criteria. Because I con am concerned about um, sort of a generalized fear that's where we don't have quantitative information yet. And I would hate to see uh, decisions made, policy decisions made on um, generalized concern or fear and not based on both qualitative and quantitative information. So planning commission is still working on that, but I think we're a ways away and I'd really like to see it come back to council as soon as possible for further vetting to try to come to some I don't know if Mr. Dominguez, you had an idea about trying to wrestle this, you know, to, to some sort of um, clarification this summer uh, before the next semiannual work session, but I'd like to see this advance, and I think it's, it's really important you know, for, for all the purposes, all the reasons we've, we've already talked about. I don't need to spend any more time on that. We talk enough at Planning Commission about this, so thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just have a couple observation points on staff's presentation, but I just want to piggyback on the AUD process, too. It's been a struggle for the three of us working with staff mm -hmm. to try and really get to a point that starts to address what you just talked about earlier, like where are we going to be when, when the gong strikes and what do we do about this lag time? And I personally believe that even though we've got a survey, that I still think the argument at that time is potentially going to be more so about the gray areas than the statistical areas. You know, what did you do to a neighborhood? What, what happened on the street? Um, what was there before? What's there now? And those are all areas that staff just kind of looks at us and goes, we, we don't have any resources to work on this type of, of information now or in the future. You know, but for, as an example, as you're looking in, um, in these developments that share um, businesses adjacent to them or very close by. I haven't seen any surveys of the surrounding areas that ask what businesses are there that are relying on non-conforming street parking because they've been there so long and are, are actively getting their customers parked on the street because until they have a categorical change of use, they don't have to comply with, with current parking uh, requirements, but you're putting a uh, AUD project right next door or right down the street from it that potentially could be driving residents' cars out into the uh, business parking places. And how is that all going to be measured and how are you going to look at it? So I, I, I don't have an answer for it. I think we need some help. I think the help is top down rather than bottom up. So I think it's more of a discussion for you guys to say it's really important that we get out in front of it and put some resources into it. Um, the two observations I have are uh, 
are one of them is echoing Commissioner Schwartz after you get by the first two or three paragraphs of the staff report. The uh, rest of the staff report really shows a um, lack of resources or funding to do things we want to do. Um, some of those things are imposed by others. Some of them are self-imposed. They all seem important. Um, they all look like then they get prioritized because of dollars rather than prioritized because of importance maybe. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to take you up on your offer to really have some input on what we think are issues that should be funded uh, as part of the budget process and then that conversation can take place at the appropriate area. But um, you know, it seems to me that uh, maybe the historical method of revenues flowing into some of these issues is just broken because the complexity of doing something today is so much more or the scope is so much more than what it was five or ten years ago and to try and live off of how you how you funded that or how you were getting your funding or not getting any funding just has these uh, consequences where you look up ten years later and something's still on this list just because it was never addressed I get the connection between uh, the positives of uh, of uh, economic development and social betterment, but at the and and not disincentivizing me to build something, but at the same time, uh, it seems like uh, we need to grab some money somewhere to put through these resources. And the other um, comment I have on this uh, was just uh, uh, Councilmember White just used the term once, but I'll carry on with that, and that's the lack of. Uh, water information in this report. I kind of feel like the water issue and the development issue are just kind of traveling down uh, 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 boulevards separately from each other and they're going to intersect at an accident rather than a place of our choosing, an intersection of our choosing. Um, we're, we know we're ahead of development from what we even projected. Um, from a supply standpoint, we're a year away from being worse off than we are now. Uh, in, in water supply. Um, every time that, we have to make findings all the time that say there are adequate blah, blah, blah services and whatever, you know, and anytime you really uh, get down in the weeds on that, somebody comes up with a number that starts with a decimal that our projected uh, water burden will be 0.65 acre feet a year. Well, when you read what's going on with the pedal to the floor, that doesn't sound right, and it just doesn't feel right given the ongoing um, supply issues. And I would even question, too, on whether the, the treatment in infrastructure is being looked at at the same time as these <coughs> development tracks are being made. If you, you know, right up the street, if you put a, or over on Anacapa, if you, you had a metal shed there that had one bathroom and it's about to have 35 units put on it, and you go around the block and up a block, and there's the same thing too. There's a park and a business building with two bathrooms there and you're gonna put 35 units there. Is what happens underneath the ground when all these changes are being made? And is the guy who has to worry about that, you know, is Josh Hagmart over on this road really paying attention to what's happening over here on this road with these, what are gonna be a thousand units in the pipeline or built in the next five years potentially? And so I think at some point you need to force these two uh, conversations together on a recurring basis and, and keep making sure that, uh, that that other department knows exactly what's going on over here and this department knows exactly what's going on over there before they just collide as a problem that you can actually man try and manage the problem before it becomes a defensive problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Mayor. So regarding the, uh, the AUD, I think the conversations that we have should really start focusing on the alternatives. And again, that's because I think there's been a little bit of mission creep and I wanna refocus the conversation on uh, the goals I think that several people or most people had in mind. Uh, Bendy mentioned police and, and teachers. And um, my, uh, my family's teachers, I was a teacher for a very short while. My parents are teachers, a lot of my friends are teachers, and, and they tend to look at home ownership as a goal. So I know that's, that's unfortunately changing in America, it's unfortunately changing in California, but I think it's still a goal here in Santa Barbara for people who wanna teach and be working in law enforcement. Um, they wanna own homes, so size is probably a secondary problem in terms of uh, 
the size of the units that have been produced so far in AUD. We had a, an appeal and the two bedrooms were 777 square feet. The three bedrooms were 1,077, so they are very small. And I don't think that's gonna appeal to, to those groups that I just mentioned, um, in addition to the, the rental versus ownership. So I think we need to, to take another good look at, at condos and townhomes and whether we're meeting the goals of uh, the people who wanna live in Santa Barbara permanently. I think what we're ending up with is a lot of dormitory, very fancy dormitory style rentals that are gonna be very appealing to, to students and recent grads and international visitors. And I, I don't think that's a group that people have necessarily been lobbying for and trying to keep in the city because permanent long-term residents bring a lot more tangible and intangible goods to the city and, and make the city much more sociable and, and long-term goals and long-term outcomes are much more enhanced in terms of education levels, prosperity, stability, lower crime levels when you have residents who stay here for a longer amount of time. So I think those are, those are two of the things I wanna look at are both ownership and the ability to incentivize condos and townhomes. I think the East Beach townhomes condos have been a great example um, of bringing in the workforce that we wanna have live here. So I wanna see if there's something we can do to enhance that um, type of project in our, in our portfolio. Um, but again, I think just offering some solutions in, in this conversation to kind of shift the focus. I don't want this at all to be a referendum on AUD, but just, hey, let's look at the, let's look at the outcomes. When we give away grant money, we're very much focused nowadays on what are the outcomes that the nonprofits are seeking to achieve, and then we monitor their ability to achieve those. And so what's good for the, what is it? What's good for the goose is good for the gander or vice versa. So I want to make sure that some of these conversations really categorize the types of people we want to help because when you blend it all together, that's when you end up with a, with a weaker product. So I want to make sure we're really categorizing the, um, the outcomes and how we're going to achieve those. The, uh, the luxury studio condos, I, I agree with Bendy, at least in, in the outcome, which is they weren't achieving the goals that we've talked about in terms of getting people off the 101 and providing housing for... Uh, for people who wanna be working here. Um, and what it does to me, the, the bigger problem is that it's the opportunity cost of losing those plots of land for other projects that would achieve those goals. And, and that's one of my big fears with AUD was seeing the types of immense numbers um, in this program is it's, it's gonna take away a lot of the land that could be um, used to achieve these very laudable goals that everyone's talking about. Um, those luxury condos did provide an opportunity because of the set-asides for the folks who won the lottery to live in, in what's a very desirable location and um, with, with sizable units. So as long as they weren't expecting to have a large family in those units, um, I think at least we can check one of several boxes, but there's other opportunities where we can check several boxes in terms of the goals that we're all trying to move for. Um, and again, going back to just the, the, the rhetoric, not calling it a test or trial, I think we just call it an eight-year full-fledged program. And I think at this point, we have enough data where we can extrapolate when we think the uh, 250th certificate of occupancy would hit. So I'd love to see even maybe three forecasts, one that's kind of just a linear progression, and then maybe a couple that just drop off like 10% a year. Although, again, there's a macroeconomic question. If we create this huge demand for construction workers, um, that whole industry is gonna become an industry that's constantly marketing to produce more of that type of housing, so it's gonna be harder to shut it down and it's gonna have more drastic impact because we didn't create kind of a longer term but shorter impact. And uh, Bendy, what is Papa Clutch? What is Papa? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I know. <laughs> For the younger audience out there, we might have to explain. Well, thank you for the update. Uh, I don't have much, I just wanna uh, echo what Commissioner Jordan said. I'm have an underlying concern that the uh, water planning and uh, uh, building planning is not necessarily as integrated as it should be. And uh, the other thing about the AUD program, most of the complaints, if not all the complaints that I get, are from people in the neighborhoods about concerned about density and parking and the impacts on the neighborhood. And that's going to be hard. <laughs> to be able to evaluate, but something we have to evaluate because it's gonna have all to do with how the program is ultimately accepted. 
as uh, I think was mentioned, it's sort of a gray area. It's all subjective, but it's also the most noise. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, I want to echo all the comments that have been made so far, particularly on the water issue, on staffing, <clears throat> and then on the AUD. I'm not sure that I, well, I want to make something clear that I think we, we sometimes forget, and I'm sure people out in the community know. AUD is everything now. It's instead of variable density. The ones that we're concerned about that are in the test are the ones that are the high density. And um, I was going through some old files, and I found the emails between me, Doss Williams, and Dale Francisco, and the map that I initially proposed in an effort to create a compromise between those that didn't want to see any increase in density and those who wanted to, in effect, wipe out what was done in 1975 and increase density all over town. Uh, and so my initial proposal included a much smaller area and it would, there wasn't the, the test idea behind it, but in going, this discussion going back and forth, and I was at all the ad hoc committee meetings of the city council ad hoc committee meeting, on, on committee on the general plan update. It, <coughs> council, then council member Francisco was concerned about, you know, how do we, you know, where, where do we, we, we try this experiment, but put in some kind of point where we, we stop and look at it and see what the effect is. Well, we had, as has been commented, we had no idea that this was going to be so appealing and so financially appealing. However, I have real concerns about, and the whole idea was, as been mentioned, to provide housing for the folks that are having to commute now because it would be affordable. Little a affordable, not capital A affordable, which is the subsidized housing. And the one pro the big project that's going to be on first represents almost a third, it represents a third of the 250 units is the 89 unit project next to the Galleria. Well, there was a story about it in News Hawk today, but an interview with the developers. It's designed to be luxury housing. <coughs> it's designed for young professionals. And I bet that the rents are going to be, are they as they are with the newly developed market rate housing, you know, you start at about 2300 for a studio. And now, of course, this was five years ago, but what staff gave as the top of the range for moderate income households was 1900 a month. As I said, that's, it was five years ago, and, and you know, obviously it's gone up since. But I am really concerned that we are not going to get what I, what I and, and the others that uh, worked on this wanted. And I think we, we've got to start looking at a way to to I, I don't know this is going to probably freak out some people but I think we've got to look at some way to close the the uh, the, uh, the ability for more units to get in because even if half of them don't get built the ones that are in the pipeline we're still way over the 250 and we will not have had any opportunity to do what the program was supposed to do, have 250 units built, and then see what is the impact. Is it the kind of housing we want, and what are the impacts on the community? Thank you. Good comments, Ms. Lodge. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. We, the first part of the report stressed or talked about sea level rise a whole bunch, and basically I think what it said is, we don't know, we're going to monitor it. Is that fair to characterize it that way? <laughs> Council Member Hodgkiss, yes, as part of the local coastal program update, the city sponsored additional sea level rise monitoring studies to incorporate our existing protective devices and management strategies. And um, what that modeling effort showed was that we um, there's a whole lot more information that we need going forward. And so 
what the models are all telling us is that until sometime after about 2060, our waterfront, our lower lying areas of the city are not really going to be affected. Right. Um, we could have, well, of course, episodic <laughs> events, something could happen in and, uh, have those anyway. I mean, right. Great picture, historic pictures of water over the Cabrillo Boulevards. So. Right. So we we embarked on a pretty focused additional sea level rise modeling effort, and through that, there were more questions that were raised. And we really feel at this point, given that NOAA is coming out with a new model, um, FEMA is doing some modeling, <clears throat> the coastal staff is not clear on really where we should be going with all this, that we should really take a further look at it, um, continue to watch what's going on in the community, um, embark on an economic analysis before we start to um, propose development restrictions on properties in that area um, so that we have a good understanding of what options cost, how they might be affecting different properties. So yeah, at this point, what we are proposing to the Coastal Commission staff is that we continue to monitor and that we do a full sea level rise analysis that includes an economic study moving forward. Having heard the staff challenges, I would assume this is not at the top of the list, am I correct? The... <coughs> this whole sea level thing. Oh, for, you mean in the planning staffs? Yeah. Um, this, the local coastal program update is the, I would say it's one of the top priorities for the long range planning section. Um, we have, you know, devoted a lot of resources to it over the last two years. Our plan right now is with the coastal staff and we're hoping to get written comments back from them at the end of April. Um, whether or not they will accept our proposal not to have development standards written into our <coughs> implementation program at this point uh, remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the sign ordinance coming up in May, we think, okay, that's fine, I wanted to be sure about that. Are we getting, and maybe I should ask this to Mr. Colon, but maybe, uh, maybe he's the right one, are we getting general resistance to our decision about vacation rentals, would you say? I, I, that, that's the sense I have, but I don't know. I don't think I, uh, Councilmember Hodgkiss, I don't think I'd call it uh, resistance. I think there is the um, uh, natural cost of enforcing the existing regulations. So people are generally complying when we get to them, but the process of getting to them is time consuming and expensive. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the zoning, um, Ms. Brooke, um, there was a, I think $7,000 for an outreach program, et cetera, to let people know. Can't we just turn that over to the Association of Realtors? It's in their interest to make it known. Council Member Hoshkus, that's, um, that's a good suggestion. And what he's referring to is a re council allocated $7,000, I believe it was last fiscal year, um, as one of the um, recommendations of the ZIR working group is to do public education and outreach to inform people about the ZIR process. <laughs> so we have not yet spent that money. We haven't retained somebody to help us do that public relations or education. I think if we could work with the realtors and hopefully get that accomplished, that, that could be one way to do it. Well, it's absolutely in their interest, and they're going to turn around and um, educate their clients and customers better than we ever would. So. And until that desire to learn is there, just talking in the wind. So we might save some money there. Um, Mr. Casey, if I could, there's a number of suggestions here that have uh, pointed to increased staff, not a lot, but some. Are we considering uh, augmenting our staff in these areas for community development? Should I ask Mr. Buell that or you? Madam Mayor, Council Member Hotchkiss, uh, in our current budget proposal, we are 
seeking to uh, augment staff, uh, specifically with related to uh, development review, because we have an awful lot of work that's coming in. And we also, as Renee mentioned, we have the types of projects that we have coming in are much more complex or taking more time. Uh, also in the planning side, <coughs> Renee, is there on, no more on enforcement, it's on, it's on development review. With, res uh, pardon me, with re design review. Yes, we, we, are, we are seeking for additional staff on the design review side. Now, as to whether or not we'd be able to keep pace with the existing uh, applications that are coming through our process as well as do some of these other special studies that are being advocated by some of you here is yet to be seen. Uh, hopefully we'd be able to do that, but I wouldn't want to make any promises at this point just because of the pace at which we're working is very brisk. And is uh, a more efficient way to do it because it's uncertain what the future market will be to use consultants so we, so we don't get locked into an employee or employee who expects to be here and then suddenly we're in the position of not really needing them anymore? Um, Councilmember Hotchkiss, we have recently, um, through salary savings, um, consulted with a contract planner to help us try to bridge the gap while we had a couple of vacancies in development review, and we found that to work really well. So I think if we do, if we don't have actual, you know, additional funds to hire contract planners where we see salary savings or have a vacancy, I think we would certainly try to utilize that more in the future. Yeah, I only say that because of the flexibility point and not knowing, not being able to predict the future. The last thing I was just going to comment as a realtor on the whole affordable housing issue is that it's basically an oxymoron in Santa Barbara. I mean, the cost of housing, new or um, turned over, is extraordinary. Having traveled in other parts of the country, we're twice what other places cost. And we'll always face that problem no matter what we do. So I'm not sure we're trying to not trying to solve a problem that simply does not have a solution. We're trying to push water uphill. I think Dale Francisco was correct in saying the best we can do is to provide um, a means of people to have rental housing. And that's just, even then, it's, as you point out, Commissioner Lodge, really expensive. But uh, there's just no other way to do it, I'm afraid. It's just a, a, a reality we're always going to have to face. And, the other side of that coin is we live in a marvelous place. That's why we're all here. But you also have to pay for it as well others who come here, and we have to accept those challenges. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, I wish we, so at some point uh, in the room, we can get the 250 people that are going to be running the units and see what they think. Okay. Uh, the... The program is intended to provide rentals, which we had not had in a number of years on a market rate basis. It was hoped it would work to produce them. The economics would work between parking and uh, number of units per acre. Uh, right now, based on the projects that are in the pipeline, uh, I believe uh, about 90% are rentals. Uh, pardon me, 90% are in the commercial zones versus 10% are in multifamily. Uh, the 90 percent, I think, encompass maybe about two acres or more of property, which means there's two acres of commercial development that will not be built in the future, except for those that go along adjunct to the particular houses. So the aspect of a jobs housing balance is being improved. Uh, the 753 units include 205 affordable. Uh, I haven't, I don't think we have a number, but a number of those in the uh, AUD project are former approvals and projects that we're processing as townhouses, a pretty significant <coughs> number, including Marisol, which per, per pro forma back in the day were going to be million-dollar condos up by the Galleria. So we have a utilization of a, re, a recasting of projects that were currently going through the system. Somehow they found out it was more economical to do this. Uh, we also have landowners participating, which is always a challenge, too, with commercial on do you sell it for top dollar for an alternate commercial use or do you stay with the program? We have a number of projects coming in where in some form the landowners, original landowners, are staying part of the transaction. Uh, the, uh, what the rents are going to be, uh, and, and we're going to survey that. And are they going to be high rents? They're going to be based upon market. Nobody's going to tell you that. 
Uh, but market in the project is going to be a pretty, hopefully it will be a broad range between the best unit on the top floor and the worst unit bottom floor parking lot. And if you have 250 units or more in the pipeline to be rented, uh, the apartment owners cannot wait around for six months to, or a year to rent their units. So uh, they're going to have to price them at what the market will bear in the fastest lease-up period they can get. That's their balancing act. So we shall see. We don't know. Uh, what we do know is if we go back to variable and we can't make the AUD or some form thereof uh, <coughs> beneficial to the community by putting all our heads together, we're back to variable. On the priority, that two acres that I mentioned, that land is about 40 percent of what it would take to produce the same number of units under variable density. So you're dealing with 40 percent of the land or 40 percent of the project processing and 40 percent of the land cost. So I think we have to look at that as being a positive. The other part, there's two parts to answer questions that are a real concern, and I, I, agree, I agree we have to monitor this. One is, how quickly can we get the results? And I think a lot of the data that's been collected on statistically, a number of bedrooms, parking, we have that on projects that are going to be part of the 250. We pretty well know two of them that are coming in. Uh, so getting the quantitative data as quickly as possible and then uh, proceeding to get the qualitative relative to rents, uh, et cetera, <coughs> it's incumbent upon us to get pretty quickly after they're done. Behavioral changes on number of cars or are you taking the bus, that's going to take some period of time to collect. And we'll find that out over time as these projects report. But that's probably not going to occur to a good degree during the test or when we make a decision. The other part is, uh, as Commissioner Schwartz dwelled on, is there's other things that we might be considering. And if we do want worker housing for sale as well, and if we do want affordable units without redevelopment, having the funds, I think maybe we do have to get creative with the groups that are very well versed in producing both of those or thinking about it. And one would be looking at the fact that we currently have uh, two affordable projects on uh, next to Mar we have one next to Marisol, we have one on South Sequoia Street next to people self-help. Two market projects, two affordable. Working independently, they got approved. What if they worked together? What if we tried to really look at mixed income projects and how we facilitate that by our zoning, getting everybody around the table to see how the benefits of an affordable project with their financing and market rate with their ability to buy dirt, which is a shortcoming for the affordable, how we possibly could put those together <coughs> So that we are getting housing that people need and we can make sure we're doing that to satisfy the community. Are we being successful? Uh, the other one is in the area you mentioned, the East Beach collection. It's in the area of we're waiting for an employer to come in to possibly propose an employer program. There are those that have done it before. Cottage did it. Uh, perhaps we have to take a look at can we adjust that a little bit and maybe take the lead. Take the lead on maybe it's an employee program, for example, that if you live and work on the south coast like East Beach, you can get into the unit, one of the, one of the owners. Is there some way to get outside help in trying to come up with a way to crystallize that, set up a template, so when somebody is interested in doing it, we could already have pre-cleared through our ordinance language and making sure everything complies with the way we want it to stay. Uh, East Beach, uh, I think it was 40 units were affordable. Seven have resold in about four or five years. Uh, four of the people that sold moved away. Three of the people that sold now have market rate houses. And there's currently, I think, nine or 10 South Coast workers in the units that turned over. So that was a unique situation. It was an industrial zone, M1, not gonna happen again. But there are other creative things that we probably can put together to see, can we get people in that are willing to take a limit on their appreciation if they can get a reasonable price with the expectation that they can move on to another house in the future. So uh, suggestions, I think perhaps our subcommittee can get together with staff with a reasonable amount of time, try to get into a skull session and see how we can maybe address these real good concerns that have come up on the table. Let's see if we can come up with some proposed solutions, not just using staff time, but the outside experts out there and the developers who have already submitted projects to get ideas from them, how we can try to solve some of these. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great discussion. Thank you. Um, couple things. One, I'm excited about the LIDAR use, uh, and I'm waiting for this room to turn into a holodeck that's going to make design review 
you know, so much easier to see things in 3D. That'd be great. I've always wanted a holodeck. Anyway, um, three three things, seriously. Uh, one is uh, about the budget, and I think that's a, a very important part, and it's very timely. And um, just for my, uh, what's worked for me as a council member and mayor looking at uh, when we have multiple priorities and competing priorities, having the commissions give us their wish list but prioritized because knowing that if you can't get everything you want, what are the absolute top one, two, three? And I'm particularly remembering during the recession, the Parks and Rec Commission, when they had a third of their budget cut, really helped us figure out you know, where are the true priorities. Uh, everything's important but some things are more important than others or more urgent than others. And um, getting your feedback, I think, would be very helpful for us as we're moving forward in the, in the budget process. So I appreciate that that was brought up earlier. Um, the second thing is, and I don't want to um, uh, suggest, I don't want to, th there is an item on next Tuesday's agenda that may add to the list, right? I think Council Members White and Dominguez is wanting um, the Council to look at the issue related to the mobile home park ordinance and its antiquated uh, language now and how that relates to what potentially could be needed to look at into the future. So I just want to put that out there and, and if the um, planning commissioners may be worth um, following up with that just or watching the meeting or just knowing that that's happening. Uh, but that might be another layer added to all the other priorities. We'll see on Tuesday how that goes. Uh, and then the whole issue of what we're trying to accomplish here, I really appreciate um, what Chair Campanella was saying about market rate and the and the financing and how it works and again to remind us why we went to this AUD process to begin with because the other alternative was variable density which we know was not working and was not providing the type of housing we need and it's always a balancing act um, I you know and, and and I'm and I appreciate the conversation I know the subcommittee's looking at what what does success look like what are we actually measuring um, just to measure something for the sake of measuring it without knowing what that means, you know, doesn't necessarily mean anything. So, you know, what is what is it that we're trying to accomplish with with that process, and to get something in place, so that when that 250th unit is occupied, we're we're ready to go. Um, I, I, you know, the issue of job housing imbalance is not just stuck within the city of Santa Barbara; it's a South Coast regional issue. And although the city of Goleta, for example, has very very different rules than we do. They have a lot of projects, um, not only in the pipeline, but actually getting on the ground much faster than us. And, uh, you know, I go out there and, and look around and see what seems to be a very significant amount of new development um, on both commercial and residential. And I look around and think, is this going to solve the issue that we keep talking about? Are the people who are going to move into those new units there, people who are living and working on the South Coast? A lot of them are not rentals, but for sale. Um, and I don't know if the city of Goleta is looking at, you know, monitoring that and as it moves forward. Um, I know it's part of their general plan, but I don't know if they're going to do the same kind of analysis that we want to do within our AUD project. But it might be a kind of a test of what kind of things are happening as those units get occupied. That will probably happen a couple of years before ours are ready. And uh, again, since this is a regional issue, to me, if you're living and working on the south coast, it's... Um, doesn't have to be living working within the city. It could be, you know, in that region. You're just trying to stay away from between Car Carpenteria and basically Gaviota. Uh, so that might be in, in connection to the other regional issue on housing authority and other affordable housing projects, not just within the city of Santa Barbara, but again, along the south coast. Uh, it's uh, having those regional conversations, I think, would be helpful. And um, we have some projects in play that are already happening. So just a suggestion there. I know that's adding... Maybe it's just a conversation. I don't know how much of a workload that would be, but um, but certainly conversations as we're having them on a regional basis anyway. Uh, so, and I hate to bring up Rena numbers, but um, you know that that's really the place where it would go through, and that's going to come up again in the next couple of years anyway. Uh, what the next um, regional housing needs assessment numbers are going to be from the state, but we want to have those that that documentation ready because um, the last thing I want is having a, um, a state mandated number of numbers come down that uh, doesn't really address the issues we're concerned and we don't have the data to show that why it does or doesn't work. Um, the last round with, with that process at SBCAG actually worked extremely well. I think we were very lucky. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be the case because um, they're looking at the full county, not just South Coast, but just something to keep in mind. Uh, 
So, and then finally, I, I just want to echo, I know we started with the public comment from Mr. Lavoie about the historical, historic element and moving that forward, but, but that obviously is a very important, it sounds like we're at two ends of a barbell here, you know, we got this newer projects, and, and then we have the historic piece, and what keeps this place so special, a big part of it is because of our heritage and historical element, and um, so I don't want to lose sight as we're looking at what's coming up as new, as we want to protect and preserve what is what has been historic or is historic. Uh, so I look forward to the planning um, process and the budget process, and uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of work going on. Any other final comments or anything before we adjourn, Mr. I, White? I, I do have two, Madam Mayor, and thank you because I. I I think that your comments really is is a is a great capper, um, but two things. One is the the adaptive management part of this uh, uh, package. It's groundbreaking, and I think that all of us and staff uh, we just we're dealing with something that that this piece, this flexibility, uh, this nimbleness that's being suggested here. There aren't. You don't don't look around to other communities. I mean, so much of planning is is taking other people's other entities' work and saying, okay, this is what we're how we're going to do it. We're we're create. This is a relatively new and 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 different process, and the flexibility is something that uh, is just uh, is something we need to be kind to ourselves and appreciate that that we're putting staff and ourselves in a new position to to take on that critical thinking. On these projects, and so uh, it's it's this is going to be an interesting uh, effort. And secondly, uh, back in the day when I was on planning commission, I used to uh, I, and, and working with the budgets more, I used to analogize uh, our fees to interest rates, saying when things are booming, it's time to to raise interest rates and it's time to raise fees. We, we are an unusual city in that we, uh, uh, if you go back to the county, for example, or you go to the city of Goleta, and, and you just get hammered with much higher uh, plan check and development fees. And so this, I know that we have full cost recovery in our plan check, but not in our planning side. And when things are really booming, and in market rate situations, uh, that may be something to look at as a as an opportunity to gain revenue, and so to increase that again, and I just to use that that analogy of of when things are booming, it's, it may be a chance to get some more revenue. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank and you. I just respond back yep. to Council Member White. I just wanted to speak to the adaptive management program and let you know that was a significant workload for staff last year. We revamped that whole report really took a step backwards presented it in October I think it was well received and we said that we would continue to work with the Planning Commission and we have we've met with them twice we already have another meeting scheduled part of that is trying to reduce redundancies and really focus it on issues so I can see that our meeting with the Planning Commission next time we can really focus a lot about the AUD and how we're going to be reporting on that moving forward and what exactly our housing activity report should include. So any other feedback that you or any of the other council members have, it would be really, really helpful to us. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We